And when he arrived to South Carolina, he said he was sold to a weak. Uh, uh, the slave owner, he said, was an infidel. He was a unreligious, unpious, he was a wicked man, a weak and frail man. And he uh, went to go work on the plantation, and they believed that it was most likely a rice plantation that he was working on. And after living uh, on this plantation for two years, he finally escaped. He ran away. And he got into uh, North Carolina. Eventually, in North Carolina, he was caught in jail as a runaway slave. And when he was in, when he was caught and put in a jail, this is where the significance of his story and why, particularly this man, Omar bin Zayed, why he is now being learned about and has been um, made into a historical figure as far as for African-American, you know, the history of African-American and the slave trade. When he was in jail, he would write in Arabic some of the poetry that he had learned. And he would write some of the uh, Islamic teachings that he had memorized during the time. And when the people, saw, when the jailers saw this, it was a very strange thing to them. They had never seen the writing before, um, let alone done by an African slave. Because the general premise at this time was that uh, Africans were so human that, and they were actually surprised that uh, he could be so learned. That he could not only know the Arabic language, know how to read it, know how to write it, and that he could re reproduce this from memory it was surprising to them. So eventually he was, uh, he was, his bill was purchased by a man named Owens. Um, I, I forget his name, first name I don't want to say it because I forgot it, but it was, his name was Owens and he was eventually the governor of North Carolina. Um, after he was purchased by Owen, he, Owen bought him from the original slave owner from whom he ran away. So this part of his uh, story was closed. He no longer had to be returned to the cruel mess. And the way he described his life, he actually lived for 50 years uh, with the Owen family. He was buried with them. He became very uh, much a part of their family. Um, and he described them as very kind people. He said that they fed him with, with what they ate and they clothed him with what they wore. Part of the reason why uh, this man's story is being commemorated is because people have tried to use it for different agendas. So one of the researchers that was, uh, whose research I looked at and studying for the subject was talking about how they were, the Southerners were trying to glorify the institution of slavery. So they used uh, Omar Ben Said's story of having found a, a, a benevolent uh, a slave owner, and they tried to use his story to justify the institution of slavery in the United States. And they were saying, see, it's not bad, the slaves were actually happy with it and all these kind of things. That was uh, about 20 years. Those kinds of writings started coming about 20 years after the Civil War, so it was around 1885. Before uh, the Civil War happened, the family used to call uh, people to come and look at uh, Omar as like a novelty. They were happy to write the Arabic calligraphy and the Arabic words that he, <laughs> that he wrote, it was kind of like a show to them because it was so strange to them. But it's important for us as Muslims that every single thing that happens that we take lesson from, that we learn from. So, first of all, 
the uh, institution of slavery, as far as it is concerned with Islam, was not abolished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made rules and regulations concerning slavery such that the people who chose to own slaves, they will be judged according to their treatment of the slaves. So under Islam, the institution was created so that for a lot of people, it disincentivized them to actually own the slaves because of the kind of treatment that they would have to give them. So nowadays, people use this and they try to say that they try to compare the institution of slavery as it happened in the United States to the institution of slavery uh, and the fact that it was not abolished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are two very, very different things. Slavery in the United States, the ownership, one person owning another person, under Islamic law, made the person basically re uh, required, uh, they were required and judged upon their treatment of the slaves. So much so that there was uh, an incident during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he saw one of his sahabi uh, uh, beating the slave. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, he said, uh, why would you treat him like this? Why, uh, why, why are you treating him in this manner? And the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, they, they intentionally don't do the job properly. They're not doing it. Uh, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, he said, would you not like to be forgiven? Well, Rasulullah uh, he's, he's informing the Sahaba that you're going to be judged on the treatment, on how you're treating this person. He said, would you not like to be forgiven? The Sahaba said, yeah, but I keep doing it over and over again. I forgive him, I forgive him. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, he said, how many times would you like for Allah to forgive you? So this is the difference between the allowance and the legislation of slavery in Islam and the legislation and the per, uh, uh, permittance of slavery in the United States. It is not the same institution. It does not look the same. In fact, if you study it, it looks that the treatment of Omar bin Saeed by the Owens family is actually how all, all slaves should be treated by their masters. And when he described them as being very nice people, he was actually given the option uh, to go back to Africa several times and he never did, he never left. Uh, one reason he stated is because he didn't know if his family was still intact. And another reason that he stated was because uh, he said the people that were treated him, they, they were kind. He described them as being kind. So, the first thing that we need to learn is that just because uh, the same word might be used to describe something, when it comes to Islam, you cannot let the non-believers equate the institution in Islam to their institution. It's not the same. It's not the same thing. It, it, it doesn't look the same in practice. Another thing is that while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not abolish slavery in the Quran, there was no means provided for legally enslaving someone outside of the war, a uh, cap was being taken, and Every incentive was given to the slave owners to free to free the slave. Um, it is because of this incentive that under Islam, the slave uh, under Islam, the number of slaves went down. 
it did not increase, it did not become uh, international slave trade the way it did for the West. Number two, through a, a couple of reasons, number one being the treatment that was required for the slave owner, and number two being the fact that so many uh, sins and so many of the practices of the people whenever they committed uh, wrong or impossible, or whenever they committed some wrong against themselves, the expiation for it was tahrir rabba, was to free the slave. And that was the first thing that they were allowed to do. So um, when we draw from the story of Umar bin Sa'id, uh, we have to keep in mind that number one, what can we learn from it? And the number one thing that we should take from it is to always hold our faith very close and to always continue to learn as much as we possibly can. Because we never know when there's going to come a situation when we won't have the opportunity to be uh, around the scholars. Because just like him, he was a brother, he was a practicing Muslim. <laughs> Described his life as going to a masjid uh, five times a day for Salah. He described his almsgiving as that he would give uh, uh, food, gold, goats, uh, you know, all of the, whatever it was that he had, he would always give, give charity as a guy. So, uh, and even this man, his situation changed suddenly. So, had it not been for the 25 years that he spent studying the deen, he would not have had that to hold on to. So we should spend our time uh, doing as, as much as we possibly can to learn our deen, to memorize it, to uh, spread it, to teach others, um, because you never know what situation we might end up in. And we never know when the opportunity is going to be taken away from us. Another thing is that no matter what situation we end up in, no matter how difficult a time we may find ourselves in, to always come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to always remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and use uh, our knowledge, use our strength in Islam to help us get through that time period. This is a man that we're talking about over 160 years later, just because of the Islamic knowledge that he was given, even though he was abducted and taken into slavery, because of the knowledge that he had, because of the uh, learning the Arabic text, and through his humbleness, his piety, he was, even in the worst situation, he was put into a better situation. Where he wasn't out uh, working in the fields, he was uh, he ran away uh, from the original owner, and eventually ended up with someone who treated him uh, so very very kindly. And it's not me saying this. Omar Ben Said said this. He described the people who he ended up with the Owens as being a kind family. He said they treated him very well. Uh, he said they, they clothed him with what they wore, and they fed him with what they ate. Which this is the standard of treatment under his law for the slave. This is a requirement, actually. Um, so just by his faith, just by his dedication, and just by his humility, by the we call it the khaf, by his character, by people recognizing the difference in the character, they did not treat him like the other slaves uh, that they had that they had captured. He was always held in a higher esteem, and he was always uh, in a more respectable manner after his initial captivity, which, once again, uh, brings us another point. That is, uh, whenever we go through any kind of hardship or difficulty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
has always prescribed two things. The first one that he always has prescribed, uh, prescribed for us is to be steadfast. Uh, and the second one uh, that he pres uh, prescribed for us always is, is the word fuss bitter. Fuss bitter is to have sorrow, to bear whatever it is that is happening in your life uh, with, with patience. I'm sorry, the first thing is uh, a solar. Uh, and what's the aim of this story? A solar. Allah reminds us over and over in the Quran. It's the aim of this story, a solar. That we seek Allah's help with patience and with prayer. Meaning that we're always calling on Allah, we're always remembering Allah, and we always preserve our faith. We always make sure that our faith comes foremost in our lives so that we uh, don't lose it and uh, that, that it gets preserved within us and within our uh, children later down the line. So it is uh, with these lessons that we can take from the life of Omar bin Saeed. And we can make sure that number one, we use our time wisely, the time that we have, because we never know when our situation might change. I mean, you can look at all around the world, all the issues that are going on, where people's lives suddenly change. And all of a sudden, what we take for granted, they no longer have. <clears throat> never become complacent that that can't happen to us, because it can. And hide from my hooks. It can happen no matter where you are. You know, it's uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only protector. It's not man or human beings that protect people. Allah is the only protector that we have, so it is that that we have to rely on. Uh, number two, uh, the lesson that we can take from Muhammad Sayyid is to uh, is to that we seek God's help with patience and prayer. We always keep our faith and we always keep our uh, uh, humility to stay to, once we have done all that we can in a situation, then we'll rely upon the law and have patience in the decree on whatever it is that we're going through. Uh, and number, the, the, the third thing is that no matter what situation we find ourselves in, we can always, uh, we can always find a way to manifest our faith. We can always find a way to preserve our faith. So we uh, know about the story of Muhammad bin Sayyid because of him writing in the Arabic script which was something unique. It is, he has the only known uh, autobiographical text that was written out of all of the slaves that were enslaved. He had the only known text that was written by the person while they were enslaved in Arabic. And it is because of those two things that we are studying him all the way up until today. We ask the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who are steadfast in our faith, among those who use the time that we have to learn as much as we can and to implement as much as we can. And we ask the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us to be patient and that he uh, brings us the good out of any situation we might get in. Our holy, holy love Alhamdulillah, 
يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم اصلح لنا ديننا الذي هو عصمة عبدنا واصلح لنا اخر واصلح لنا دنيا التي فيها معاشنا واصلح لنا اخرتنا التي فيها معاننا واجعل الحياه زياده لنا في كل خير واجعل الموت راحه لنا من كل شر لا اله الا الله لا اله الا الله الحليم الكريم سبحان الله رب العرش العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين نسالك موجبات رحمتك وعزائم مغفرتك وغنيمة من كل بر والسلامة من كل إثم لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا حاجة هي لك رضا إلا قضيتها يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم انسوري الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه محمد وعاله وأصحابه أجمعين آمين برحمتك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء القربى وإنحاء للفحشاء والمنكر والبغض يعلكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم واستغفروه لذنوبكم إنه هو الغفور الرحيم وأقيموا الصلاة. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا